Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 684. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today, September 7th, 2021. All right, we are back from Labor Day weekend, which is a, a celebration we have in America when we celebrate labor or unions or something. It's all convoluted, but it's a three-day weekend, and it's the la- kind of the last weekend of summer, so you do everything you're supposed to want to do all summer. You, you pack into one weekend. Jill says, let's go kayaking. So, George, we, we went kayaking on a lake next to us. Oh, people have been asking me, Kevin, where are you? Let me pull out the map. And I'm over here in Wisconsin this week. I'm no longer up in Door County. We are just southeast of Madison. Uh, if I can pull this up quicker, it'd be nice. Uh, and this little lake right here called Lake. Oh, that's on it. Lake. No, 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 no. Going southeast here. Lake Wabasa. That's where we are. And uh, we went kayaking. Why, why does your map highlight all these restaurants? Are these stops for you on your bike tours? Or? Well, I don't want to talk about that, George. But yes, we, 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 I yelp those things all the time. Where do we want to eat today? What do I want to cook out today? Can we have brats four days in a row, which is a, a Wisconsin tradition? It's also ragweed season here. If you notice, my voice is deeper and my nose is more nasally. I'm dealing with the pollen issues that are very apparent in Wisconsin. Uh, George, what have you been up to? Well, Monday, Labor Day for me, was a day of labor. Uh, make and mend at the house. I did my ironing and all my all my shirts are now properly creased. I sewed buttons back onto cassocks. I let out pants, took in shirts, all these things. Uh, put all put. I've got the huge pile beside my chair in the in the uh, living room, and finally got to work on all the mending I needed to do. That's good. All right. I mean, very it's... manly activity, Kevin. I admit it. Very manly. But hey, otherwise I look like a scarecrow, all well, raggedy. I think I you get a, you, get you need it. to renegotiate your contract to have tailor services provided. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. We should move on to the news before we get there. Um, it is our tradition to ask you to like our program on Facebook or YouTube. Likes are free. It's a free way to promote uh, this show. And George and I can't do it. My one like isn't going to do it. But your thousands of like will make this free advertising for us. Please share this with your friends, family, and foes. We get a lot of comments in the comment sections. Um, but I want to see more of discussions. You know, what do you think of the topics we're talking about? Do you have any other topics that you want us to talk about? Do you have any news that we've not covered? You can add that in the comment sections, or you can email us. You'll find that at the Anglican.inc website. Subscribe if you've not subscribed. And if you don't want to watch us, you can just listen to us. And you do that by um, listening to the podcast. You get that through the show notes on YouTube. Okay, George. The tradition continues. We're going to start with a good news story, and it comes all the way from Ireland. David McCall, the Bishop of Down and Dremore, released a pastoral letter on uh, the 5th, September 5th, asking for a call for renewal and revival. Now, bishops put out these sorts of things all the time, and I read them, and I usually roll my eyes because they involve, let's go out and agitate for... uh, voters rights or climate change here's how here's how we're going to shake the holy spirit and get him to do or get it to do what we want it to do and of course revival doesn't work that way revival is an action of the holy spirit working the hearts of the believers in the community and what mccall is saying is that you need to have yourself ready for the movement of the spirit and so the, what we're going to do is we're going to be beginning to dedicate ourselves as individuals and as, as, as a religious community to prayer, to scripture, to be able, if and when the Spirit does move us, our hearts will be primed and ready to go forward. And so I'm very, how should I say this? I don't want to sound silly, but yes, this could be the start of something big because the Anglican Communion is in, is in a state of entropy. Uh, it's just lukewarm it's, everywhere. It's if and getting colder. 
it's leaderless. Well, yeah, Justin Welby's on vacation, uh, but you know, Gafcon's not really leading hard right now. It's kind of this vacuumless, leaderless uh, entity, and it, it's hard to see. But I think it's time now for a revival within the church. Now, this Irish person is is saying it correctly. Because I remember in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, the way we have revival is we're going to stir up the spirit. We're going to get under our tents. We're going to turn up the microphones and the speakers, and we're going to stir that spirit into action. And, you know, as a layperson, my understanding is you start with repentance, and you start with listening, and you start with humbling yourself. And that's where, uh, you know, true revival starts. Yeah, I mean, you can't nag God. I mean, that's how most revivals seem to operate, that uh, we we keep scratching a niche, we call God, and hopefully he'll fill it. But the reality is you start with yourself. You start with opening your repentance, mm-hmm. forgiveness of sin, and putting yourself in an attitude, in a position, so that when the Spirit does start to flow, you can move in the direction the Spirit is calling you to move. Because too often we set up these false parameters and these false things. You know, uh, I can remember going to general conventions, and I remember Bonnie Anderson, who used to be the vice president of the House of Deputies, the Episcopal Church, saying the election of Gene Robinson was a movement of the spirit. And I said to her, how do you know? Well, because it did what we wanted it to do. <laughs> That's right. um, and so basically I said, well, so every vote of the general convention is a movement of the holy spirit yes of course it is george and and now she was full of excitement and enthusiasm i don't think she was thinking about what she was saying but the point being the uh we so often confuse what we desire with uh the lord's will and here this bishop in uh, in belfast is laying the grounds for something that is so vital right now because the church at the churches, be they Catholic or Pentecostal or Episcopalian or Anglican, really seem dead right now. Could be the summer blahs. It, could it be might be the summer blahs. Yeah, it might be the summer blahs. Yeah, but but you know, at any point in any time, when there is a line for repentance, I want to be first in line. If there's a line for being, you know, to humble thyself, I, I want to be first. Of course, that, that's that's counterintuitive. I want to be last in the line for humbleness. No, I want to be first. You, you get what I'm saying. You know, you, you always want to be ready for when uh, the Holy Spirit does call upon you, and uh, you can't do that being first and being mm-hmm. uh, non-repentant and and seeking your desires. Uh, you have to seek the kingdom of God well, first. One of the themes that we keep hearing across the political spectrum, uh, at least in the United States, is the failure of the elites, uh, be they medical science, be they the political elites, be it the military, uh, be it the church, be it the courts, be the institutions that once held these positions of awe and reverence among people have lost their authority Um, and so when we hear something from the Center for Disease Control we're now hearing it through political filters or when we hear the court ruling we're hearing it through a political or personal filter we're not seeing any deep profound principles and that malaise I'm old enough to remember Jimmy Carter's famous speech about the malaise America entering a period of malaise and well politically we're back to where we were with Jimmy Carter but also the church is in that same period of malaise of we have no real firebrand leaders uh, calling us to renewal repentance and so when David McCall makes this public proclamation that this should be our focus it really causes my ears to, to perk up to prick up and because, you know, he's absolutely right. I mean, we need to start getting right with God as individuals, and then as a community and as a country. We're kind of in the same malaise we were right before 9/11, mm-hmm. and I think right now with the current leadership we have, we're in a more dangerous situation than we are uh, were with 9/11. Um, you know, everything's cyclical in politics and left and right. I talk about the pendulum. Um, we need to be careful now. 
Uh, we have let uh, off a spark in the Middle East, and that spark wants vengeance. And we are, we will be a target, George. Uh, let's move on. We've talked enough about story one, the good news story. But do pray for revival, people. Um, Church of Wales unexpectedly, no, very expectedly, votes for same-sex blessing rights, George. The church in Wales has done something that is absolutely expected of it. It has voted in its general uh, general assembly, uh, go its governing, bo governing body, which is the name for its synod, has voted uh, to by two-thirds in the House of Bishops, clergy, and lay people to authorize same-sex blessings. And the vote among the bishops was unanimous. Now, this has been a long time in coming. Uh, the former primate, Barry Morgan, was a political operator. He, uh, before that, was Rowan Williams. But then when Barry Morgan came, Barry Morgan was a partisan. And he promoted several left agendas within the church spectrum. And he's now been able to achieve all of these. And partially, it has been through appointments in the House of Bishops, driving out conservative clergy. Uh, so it's the trajectory we've seen in so many other places, the Episcopal Church, the Church of Sweden, where first the issue was women. Uh, we had a flying bishop in Wales for people who wouldn't accept women's mm -hmm. orders. When he retired, they didn't replace him because you should be able to accept any bishop. Then, uh, you know, women's orders were considered, you know, optional. You can or you cannot approve them. It's up to your conscience. That disappeared. And now we're going down the gay issue, where um, first you can't have gay blessings, then we have uh, a gay partnered bishop, and now we have gay blessings. And of course, you'll never be compelled to do this. But next week, the uh, Church of Sweden's General uh, Synod is going to vote whether to compel clergy to do gay blessings. And we'll wait, see the wait, same progress. When you say compel, else. compel is not optional. Right. Okay, right. capel right. means you are forced to, if a person, uh, a couple comes before you and they are uh, seeking a same-sex blessing, you are required uh, under the compel option, not an option, uh, to perform the right, George. And also it would be a civil or matter because Swedish law, Welsh uh, law permits gay marriage, gay blessings. And the, there has always been a religious exemption. You cannot be compelled to do something against your religious conscience. Now the Church in Wales is saying well, there is no religious objection in the Church of Wales to gay marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and so it now becomes if you refuse to do a gay blessing, you're becoming guilty of discrimination because gay rights trump your personal conscience. <clears throat> so it's a slippery slope. We've seen it before on other issues, and it's all going. It's all headed in the same direction. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, the Church in Wales is on life support. It is minuscule. Um, very, very few number of people falling rapidly. Its bishops are by, uh, pretty cretinous group. There's the one woman bishop uh, who. Uh, earlier this summer made the newspaper by basically tearing into the conservative party with vicious political uh, rhetoric she was what we call a mean tweeter a mean tweeter <laughs> mean um, tweeter <laughs> so it's 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 the church that wants to regain its popularity among the people and it's doing this by appealing to liberal platitudes and truisms and ignoring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And of course, what is the end result going to be? Collapse and further alienation from the people. We pray for revival in Wales and in Scotland, um, uh, places that need it. You know, you, you, you've lost the church there. You've lost your leadership role in the country. Uh, nobody seeks you for counsel. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> You've created a vacuum, and society and culture and all that's bad with the world will fill that that vacuum. <sighs> okay, so a uh, couple other stories we have. Friday night, late, I got a um, press release from the ACNA saying that they're going to uh, have further investigatory um, look into what's happening in the upper Midwest. 
And in as such, Bishop Atkinson, who was just uh, appointed there as a, not an intern, but, you know, what was his role there, George? He was one of the assisting bishops assisting, while uh, Stuart Ruck is on, vac is on right. leave. On leave. I uh, will be stepping aside as well. And I'm like, now what? <laughs> There's the, what, what more story could we have from the upper Midwest, which has you know, suffered recently for the last four months a, a bad news? Is there any good news that's going to come out of this? And yes, it's a redeemable situation. But what have we learned uh, about the Bishop Atkinson uh, stepping aside, and what what are they doing now in Upper Midwest? Well, we can report what formally has happened, and then we can speculate what it means. Yeah. Uh, so we, I, I want to be clear what about about the distinction between sure. the two. All right. A week and a half ago, the executive committee, <clears throat> excuse me, of the ACNA authorized the expansion of the investigation in the Upper Midwest. The investigatory team came back said we'd like to add these additional avenues of uh, inquiry and <clears throat> that we commented on the time is usually a sign either of a political fishing expedition which would be in the in the american politics or they've got a hot lead and they really need to get the approval to go forward into an area not part of their original uh a smoking gun yes yes so then the following week, the Bishop uh, Atkinson, who is the tallest bishop in the ACNA, if, you, if you're interested in these <laughs> things, a press release was sent out on a Friday night saying that he had been, he had stepped aside from his position as one of the supervising bishops, interim bishops with John Miller of the Diocese of the Upper Midwest. Now, little detail. His Via Apostolica, which is his jurisdiction, is a missionary territory. Though located in Canada, it is not a constituent part of the Anglican network in Canada. Via Apostolica and the Anglican network in Canada have different views on women's orders. Mm -hmm. So it has, for canonical purposes, been part of the Diocese of the Upper Midwest. Its clergy are under that diocese. So from a technical perspective, it would be a bit awkward to have Bishop Atkinson investigate being part of the investigatory team of a diocese where his clergy are already resident. So he was, he was asked to step down. That's the surface level. Um, what does it mean? Or it can mean one of two things. It could be purely procedural that you really can't have the fox guarding the hen house. Or it could mean that the clergy in the Via Apostolica, who are part of the Upper Midwest, canonically, have made a complaint against their bishop, and now this has been picked up. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. It yeah. could be procedural. It could be... You know, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty, especially in canonical affairs, because anybody can make a complaint and the church is bound to investigate it. And so one of the things people say to us, you didn't report that so-and-so has had charges filed against you. I like to wait till the charges have been either <laughs> disaffirmed or dismissed because, you know, anybody can make charges. Yeah, we and like, we like to, well, we like multiple uh, sources. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually when, at that point, you're still a single source. Yeah. Yeah. And just like, you know, we've heard from one or two sources from one side in the upper midwest regional scandal but i've not heard the other side so i really can't give a sense of where things are so i don't know what's happening with bishop atkinson but i can't say from a pr perspective this is another kick in the gut for the diocese of the upper midwest to have a second bishop part of an uh, under now part under investigation um you know the religion news service for some reason has picked up this story and continues hitting it again and again and again somebody's got friends and the religion news service is a very hard left outlet so For, that it's yes. not going to give you a good shake if you're in the acna and they don't so it's they don't know the, two they don't know two sides of a story yeah and so they're painting the ace the acna in very dark tones of uh, manipulative evangelical kooks mm -hmm. and whatnot 
a sort of thing you'd expect from them. But it's just this is just as another bullet in their chamber for them in taking out the ACNA. Yeah, and I think that's kind of their desire is to, you know, the ACNA has been one of the few growing denominations here in the U.S. over the last ten years. Let's let's cut it off. Let's let's stop that. Let's make them like every other denomination. And uh, ACNA, to its credit, is doing a full investigation here. Is willing to expand the investigation. Uh, is willing to make it public with George and I and other uh, press. They're not hiding anything, not that I can see. So we'll have to see what happens. This is one of those. Um, church is hard. Church operations is hard, even in the best of times. Even if your doctrine is perfect, you deal with these things that happen within the church. Um, and you. that's why we have the system. The system is set up that you don't step you you have steps to follow when certain things happen and the steps weren't followed in the diocese of the upper midwest uh, according to the canons and bylaws and this is what happens let this be a good lesson to all the other dioceses uh within the acna and the episcopal church follow your steps so nobody gets hurt and i think this advice should be taken by the scottish episcopal church the ACNA is being very transparent. Uh, it is not hiding anything. Um, it is allowing the processes to work in full, full public view. Compared to what's happening in the Scottish Episcopal Church, uh, which has just done everything wrong from the very beginning in the saga of Bishop Anne Dyer and the Diocese of Aberdeen and Orkney. Now, we have reported on her before. Uh, she was the... Uh, bishop who fired an organist and she went into hiding after she fired it because she's afraid the organist would kill her. Uh, she is the uh, person who showed up in a rural diocese and doesn't have a driver's license or a car. Uh, she, you know, th sh this bishop has a history enough to make the news flow of Anglican unscripted. But now we find out there's been an investigation into her bullyingness, George. There's something. Uh and Dyer, it, Aberdeen and Orkney was the conservative Scottish Episcopal Diocese. Its bishop, prior bishop, had been against gay blessings. He'd been in the sort of the mainstream of the Anglican world. He retired. They had an election, but they didn't, were not able to elect somebody. And so the choice went to the, the College of Bishops of the Scottish Episcopal Church. And the Scottish Episcopal Church bishops decided to stick their finger in the eye of the Diocese of Aberdeen and Orkney. This diocese had opposed women clergy and was against the gay agenda, all this and that. So what do they do? They appoint a woman liberal bishop. Now, she's not gay. She's married uh, to a man. But they basically appointed a British academic. She was the dean, I think, Cramner Hall in Durham. She was That's the right. dean of a seminary. A seminary. And, and so in 2017, she's appointed bishop. She's not elected, she's appointed. And the Scottish Episcopal Church goes on and on and on about, oh, it's made history, it's first woman bishop. And it was so evident that this was a, uh, a uh, affirmative action appointment to show that the Scots were uh, really on the ball. And, and Aberdeen and Orkney is way up in the north of Scotland. Uh, this, is, this is rural cow country. Well, she comes in, and she just does not m mesh with her clergy. And reports begin to pile up of bullying, of pre a preemptory firing. She fired the, cathedral, the organist at the cathedral, and then she said, I was so afraid of what he would do, I locked myself in the vestry of the cathedral, afraid for my life. The, the clergy, conservative, prominent, clerg a prominent conservative clergyman who was against her appointment, she just fired, fired from his position, removed him from office without warning, explanation, anything. And so complaints piled up. And finally, the Scottish Episcopal Church began an investigation, and it had promised to be transparent and open, and the results would be made known. And they brought a man, man Professor Torrance, uh, who is the retired moderator, which is head of the Church of Scotland, which is the Scottish Presbyterian Church, the big church there. He interviewed over a hundred people, and he 
produced a report called the Torrance Report and gave it to the bishops. The bishops have refused to release it, except somebody leaked it to the Times of London. And I've been waiting for somebody else to do it, but only the Times of London has this report, so I've not really been able to run with it because it's I can't be checked. Single source. Single source. Well, this weekend, other newspapers came out, and whether they're just copying what's in the Times, at this point, I think I'm comfortable to say what the report said that Ann Dyer, there was no justification for what she did. Nobody was trying to kill her. She's just a horrible manager. We investigated her further at the seminary. She was a horrible dean, a martinet. And we recommend that she take immediate terminal sabbatical and you get a new bishop. Wow. This is the outsider's report. Yes. Which heard both sides yeah. and says this woman is unfit to be a bishop. And so what do the Scottish bishops do? They hide the report. And of course, Torrance is angry. It's been hidden. And somehow it gets to the Times. The Times splashes it out. And the Scottish Episcopal Church's response is, oh, this is so mean that somebody would say mean things about this lovely woman bishop and spread these rumors about a report which is secret. Well, it's not supposed to be secret. It's not, this is not going to end well. And the Scottish Episcopal Church, in its attempt to be politically correct, picked the wrong token. Um, uh, uh, so... This poor northern rural diocese in Scotland Where can't get even, any far north, but it's yeah. going to get poorer. Even the farm animals are orthodox. This is this is this is pure country, you know, way up north. I don't know. You know, it, it's hard to watch this. Uh, I always sit back and I see a story like this, and I'm like, you know, the biggest lie told within and outside the church in the last thirty years is mutual flourishing. You know that uh, these these two things can run congruously and nobody gets hurt and it it didn't happen anywhere successfully in england um or i'd say britain uh so you know love to see you. well kevin do you know what the second biggest lie is uh-huh lessons will be learned oh, yes <laughs> we won't make that mistake again <laughs> no, and we're, can i mention the uh the andrew graystone book yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, um, the, uh, there's a book that just came out. You can't buy it in the U.S., unfortunately, because I checked on Amazon. It's only on Amazon UK, and the shipping is more than the cost of the book. It's called Bleeding for Jesus. Andrew Greystone is an advocate for abuse victims, clergy abuse victims, and he's published a report on the John Smythe affair. And... He's gathered all the information. He's talked to witnesses. It's it's a devastating report on who knew what when and what did they do about it. And the answer is those in power knew much about it immediately on. What did they do about it? Nothing. They just shipped this guy off to Africa and hoped he'd bother uh, little black boys instead of little white boys. Mm -hmm. And Smythe, of course, true to form, did, and the child died and all this and that. And, well, what... But where has been the response, I think is fascinating. One of the people in this book is a man named Alistair Payne, who was the rector of an evangelical church in Cambridge. He was named as a victim of Smythe as a young boy. And then when he was a rector, uh, currently is a rector, he uh, had victims come to him and he basically did nothing about this, even though he was a leader in the evangelical movement. The complaint is, oh, how evil Andrew Greystone is for outing Alistair Payne. And how mean this is. And, of course, this outsider can't really tell us conservative evangelicals how to police ourselves when he has done this terrible thing of outing Alistair Payne. Problem is, Payne was outed in 2017. when one Because we have these documents that were given to us and everybody in this in the press world listing uh, potential Smythe victims. One of them was Alistair P., rector of this church in Cambridge. And all you had to do was look up the church website, who's the Alistair P. on the, th on the thing. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, no, he was outed four years ago. He wasn't outed recently. Um, 
just that nobody reads Anglican Inc., I'm afraid. I'm sorry. No, they uh, do. Well, I got oh. the stats. Yeah, you got 40,000 clicks. The, 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 yeah. where, I'm, where, I, where I'm coming from is, you know, the whole mantra of this evangelical abuse scandal is lessons will be learned. We'll start listening to victims. We'll start taking responsibility. We won't just live in an atmosphere of cover-up and mutual back-scratching. And what do we have? The latest uh, example, cover-up and mutual backscratching. The crime is not John Smythe's victimization and Alistair Payne's failure to act on knowledge he had. The crime is Andrew Greystone's telling the world about it. Yeah. And if that's the attitude, you're never going to get past this. Yeah, if you always have shoot the messenger attitude, uh, when it comes to crises, and this is a crisis in the church, you know, steps weren't followed. Uh, you had a, a person who was not basically evil, true evil, working within the uh, evangelical stream of uh, the Church of England. Oops, you know, it, it got away from you. You tried to export that evil somewhere else. It blew up there. And now you're trying to do a cover up and keep shooting the messengers who come forth with more information about the cover-up and you and, know let richard nixon tell you that doesn't work you know now now we've had multiple commentators on our on the on our show mm -hmm. write to me and say george you just don't understand the culture uh the, in other words when we talked about the saint helen's bishop gate uh, mm -hmm. and why that fella didn't speak out and it was written back, well, he was at a boarding school. He was the head of the OTC. He was in the military then. And it just would be unthinkable for him to speak up and speak out against uh, abuse done to him. And my response has been, I was part of the parallel American versions of those things. Mm -hmm. And if I had been abused, you better believe when I was 13, 14, 15 years old, I would have been on the phone to my father, and my father would have been there either with a shotgun or with a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> and so perhaps it is cultural, but it is absent from the American cultural psyche, at least my American cultural yeah, same psyche. Same here. Same here. Yeah. And uh, I just can't understand why it is that... And I've talked to other Englishmen that I've known, and Welshmen and Scotsmen uh, and Irishmen, and they tell me, I don't know what these people are up to. And it may be with a class within a class within a, a world that is so defensive that, as the copy of the, the title of the book says, they have to bleed for Jesus in order to prove their faithfulness. Well, friends, that's not Christianity. That's Stoicism. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we've we talked before about the educational caste system that exists, certainly in England and the UK. Um, and I think that is a small part of it, but I don't understand the acceptance of abuse, especially painful, violent abuse within the church when other people knew. Nobody said stop. One, this is anecdotal, so take it for what it's worth. One of our correspondents has written to us, and this story has come to us from other places, where this uh, man uh, lived in the same house with Justin Welby when they were in young university days. And this man was a working class, poor background. And Welby, of course, is an old Etonian. But Welby was pitied because he was so very poor and had such hardships and trials, having been a poor boy at a posh boarding school. And the, the, young, the young man telling this story, who had been from a working class background, was saying, uh, a, these are my words, but you know, I, my mind boggles that the upper class would look on Welby with such pity that the poor boy from Eton had such a hard life compared to the poor boy who grew up in a northern mining town. Uh, in other words, they, you know, it, it's almost was another country, another clan, another another nationality. Mm -hmm. Welby was one of us and the poor, the working class, the, the bourgeois, they're not us, therefore they don't deserve our sympathy. Um, now who knows if Welby was abused by Smythe also, I have no clue. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it, 
his silence on this is because people have said again and again he knew about this as a young man he knew about this when he was a knew this about this all along he was part of the inner circle that everybody knew everything and yet he's saying oh i didn't know about this officially until i was archbishop in this yeah yeah what are, you know I don't know if this is true or not, but this is what the talk is. That this is what the talk is. This is the emails we get and stuff like that. Um, we're making no official pronouncement. We're just uh, letting you into the, the lower side of the rumor mill here at Anglican Unscripted. Um, let's talk about, I don't know, George, if it's COVID, the end of summer, everybody's tired, some type of spiritual exhaustion going on. But right now here, in the Anglican world, and I okay, all denominations, I feel or sense a a an exhaustion, a spiritual exhaustion uh, in this world, and I think it's all all the things I listed above, maybe especially COVID, where there's no spiritual leadership in dealing with the pandemic. There's no spiritual leadership in dealing with politics. There's no spiritual leadership in dealing with the the events of the day. Um, I got an email this morning, a press release from Justin Welby and the Pope and the Jewish leadership and the Hindu leadership expressing the desire that we take on climate change. Oh boy, thank you for bringing that up in a pandemic when the whole world is looking for leadership. We need to, to, uh, to uh, be earnest and have our thoughts and prayers on climate change. When that's kind of the bottom issue right now. This world is reeling from the economic disaster that a pandemic causes, from the uncertainty that a pandemic uh, causes, from the empty churches that a pandemic causes. And we have to worry about climate change, which has, if anything, with the, the strict to our economy, uh, lessened climate change. So can't we look here forward in a vision to how the church can respond and be a leader in this time and this age. What a great opening this pandemic COVID was for the church, for the Pope, for the Archbishop of Canterbury, for the leaders of all these mainline denominations and religions. You had a great opportunity. And right now in September of 2021, your church is exhausted and your people are like, would somebody stand up and lead us? And I gotta say, I'm not seeing this from GAFCON, I'm not seeing this from the Archbishop Canterbury, but he is on sabbatical. But I would expect the same if you were not on sabbatical. So, am I wrong? Am I just, is just this Kevin being exhausted? And I'm never exhausted. <gasps> George. Well, I'm exhausted. And it showed them that rather than work on stories yesterday, I worked on my sewing. That's right. uh, <laughs> you darn Kevin, person. <laughs> Kevin, you have your finger on the pulse, I think, of the, the religious world. Um, there's no energy. There's no enthusiasm. There's no competition. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a little story. Uh, Jonathan Goodall, the Bishop of Ebb's fleet, one of the flying British bishops for Anglo-Catholics, entered the Catholic Church this week. The response has been like, oh, well, <laughs> oh, well, yeah. in other words, now, of course, um, there's a bit of triumphalism on uh, some Catholic websites, but there's no sense whatsoever that this is anything other than uh, one individual's personal choice. He now wants Pepsi instead of Coke. Uh, the, now, well, I'm not trying to, to belittle or demean anybody. But there's no momentum anywhere. Zero, but whatever. Yeah. There, there's no no momentum anywhere. There's no enthusiasm anywhere. Yeah. The Catholic Church, the Orthodox churches, the there just seems to be a, to my mind, an exhaustion, spiritual, emotional. Um, perhaps COVID is a reflection of this exhaustion, rather than the cause of the exhaustion. Um, I, I just can't get my my finger my uh, hand, head around this mm -hmm. um, that leaders no longer lead they just follow and when they do make statements we just well ignore them really they go one in an ear and out the other and 
this takes me all the way back to Belfast in our first story. What do we do? We get on our knees and we pray. Um, what do I do? You know, with with my church, um, I'm still. Well, I've done, been. I'm a numbers guy, and I'm where my church is where it was in 2015, meaning I've six years of uh, of work in attendance is out the window. No, I'm okay. just going to have to work and build it back up again. Well, you, I think but, you're judging August numbers in a Florida church. <laughs> Well, but my, my, my point is that uh, either I can just get up and say, gosh, here's my opportunity to win back these people and gather new ones and mm -hmm. build new programs. But instead, my heart has been more focused on mourning what I've lost rather than dreaming about what might be. And that comes back to my doing God a favor by my working this much harder to do this much more for his church when of course that's not how it works i think what you're right kevin yeah. your, your opening point kevin was absolutely smart, spot on yeah. well i think there's always a, a spiritual temptation or a temptation to look at what's behind us more importantly than looking at what's in front of us we always want to judge everything from, from what's behind us always looking over <laughs> our shoulder you're looking at the cat now or is it no, no the what's cat. behind you is your cat yeah, he's bouncing all over the place. Oh, we have a thunderstorm about to start. We should probably close out here. But we as individuals, as humans, as Christians and non-Christians, always judge the future by what happened in the past. And that's not the way the kingdom works. The kingdom only wants you to look at the at, to to look forward and to pray forward, not to pray in the past. And I, I would hope that our audience would take that to heart. If you really want a chance at repentance, it's open to you every moment of every day. If you want a chance to grow closer to God, I recommend a little fasting and a lot of prayer. Um, there, there's, there's no quicker way to, to find out where you are in, in this role uh, than those. Uh, if you are not part of a church, you need to be part of a church. You need to be part of a body that worships uh, the living God. And uh, I do recommend, I know some in our audience aren't, now is a great opportunity to, to take your relationship with God to that next level where you, you're worshiping in community and where you're, you're gathering with brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage each other. Um, I, I can't speak any higher of that method uh, to, to finding your role in this, in this world. And, and Kevin and I, I think, give away our uh, where we come from because when we talk about church, what we mean is what is defined in the Articles of Religion, which is the gathered body of men and women who come together to worship the Lord, not the Episcopal Church, not the Catholic. In other words, we're not talking denominations no, not at here. All. We're talking about that fellowship of believers. Um, and I'm going to say something heretical. You can go to heaven and still be Catholic. You can go to heaven and be a Methodist. You can know the Lord and be a Baptist, even an Episcopalian. Oh, now you're going way out there, George. Well, I know. <laughs> but it's, that, it's the gathered fellowship of believers who gather around the Bible and the sacraments. And how, whatever it looks like in your community, be there, be part of that, mm -hmm. and allow Christ into your heart so that you do that work, that yeast in the community of building the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this world is full of good churches that have faithful people um, that aren't swayed by what goes on with COVIDs, with politics, with you know the culture. And those are the churches you want to look for if you have if you're not part of one um, already. George, we've done a wonderful program. We're at 44 minutes. We have the most patient audience ever. I hear the thunder coming. Hopefully, it'll go so I can go for a bike ride. But until then, I'll be editing this show. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 684 of Anglican Unscripted.